Sorry. I said, I know nothing in that regard. So I've deferred to you <laughs> and your <laughs> hair. Uh, so thank you so much. I'm, I've, I've been such a huge fan of CSP and uh, we've done programs with my whole family. Of course, you remember at the Brandeis Bardeen Institute. It's, it's been such a pleasure. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here with Rabbi Spitz, who's written about the subject of afterlives. And I remember um, that Shabbat is his, his home very fondly. And I see some um, familiar faces and familiar names here. Uh, on the Zoom, at least the ones in the section that I can see. It's, it's wonderful to see CSP folks again. Um, and of course, it's always a, a pleasure to reconnect with my friend Ari Katz uh, under any circumstance. Of course, this is a strange COVID circumstance, but clearly it allows some flexibility that I had never really used Zoom this way until COVID came. Um, so our subject today is reincarnation. So this is a, an interesting question that people ask a lot. Do Jews believe in reincarnation? Um, and of course, it depends which Jews you ask. Uh, the afterlife is a tricky question. Um, in the Talmud, of course, we find an entire tractate dedicated to how to celebrate Passover and observe the laws around the prohibition against the eating of, of chametz or any leaven products. But there is no um, organized conversation. There is no tractate that deals with beliefs, that deals with theology in a systematic way, um, that deals with the question of the afterlife. It comes out as an aside comment here and there. So in the Talmud, there is reference to the olam haba, or world to come. Um, there's also, and that's a place of reward. There is um, also the concept of Gehenim, or a place of punishment. Um, exactly how this works, what is the nature of the reward, what is the nature of the punishment, is never really very clearly spelled out. But what we do see is that the uh, concept of reincarnation is not present in, uh, in the Talmud. Um, and in fact, we find some after the period of the Talmud with the development of Jewish philosophy or various forms of Jewish ras rational thought, some very important uh, voices, some scholars do mention reincarnation in order to reject it. So Rabbi Sajid Gaon rejected the idea of uh, reincarnation as being absolutely absurd. Other important thinkers from the Middle Ages, from the 12th, uh, 11th and 12th centuries, like Yehuda Halevi and Moses Maimonides, um, they rejected or it did not even discuss reincarnation as an idea. But medieval Kabbalah, starting in the 13th century, did embrace reincarnation. And so today I want to talk about what exactly this view is, why it developed, and how it turned out to be so popular, including even until today, at least in some Jewish circles. Um, and as it relates to my research on Kabbalah now and how Kabbalah relates to Jewish historical consciousness, the question is, what role did the notion of reincarnation play for Jews? What social work was accomplished by the notion that every life that one finds themselves to be living is actually part of a succession or series of lives? What kinds of social problems does this help address? How does this help Jews make sense of the world? And then what is the nature of Jewish identity that is created in a world in which Jews imagine themselves to be reincarnations of previous versions of themselves? Um, so first of all, uh, some brief definitions. So the most common word that is used to refer to the phenomenon of reincarnation and rebirth is Gilgul in Hebrew. Gilgul comes from the Hebrew word for revolution um, or rotation. So it's a kind of recycling of souls that they are um, the, the, the way we use sort of reincarnation of being reanimated into a body. This is um, a sort of recycling of souls from one life to another. Sometimes in English, this is also um, referred to as metempsychosis or the transfer of the psyche from one place to another. Um, and this generally is, takes the place, takes the form of different bodies over successive lifetimes. So now who believed in this? As I mentioned, the Talmud doesn't discuss reincarnation. It doesn't use the word Gilgul. This is a medieval term that is developed in primarily in Kabbalistic texts. There's some notion, some discussion of it in the eighth century um, Karite scholar Anand ben David, 
Um, however, he did, was a part of the Karite sect, which didn't embrace rabbinic Judaism or the Judaism of the Talmud. Um, and there were really no important Jewish thinkers in his time or immediately thereafter who embraced this idea until, as I mentioned, we get to um, medieval Kabbalah. Um, where does this idea come from? And that's almost a trick question, meaning are there other, possibly other cultural or religious systems where, uh, from which Gilgul is adopted. So for example, when Kabbalah begins to circulate in Southern France and Northern Spain in the early 13th century, at the same time, there was the Albigensian uh, group. There was sort of this heretical Christian group, also known as Cathars. And they believed in a form of, of Gnosticism, an idea that this world is a kind of, um, a kind of trick by an evil God and that souls are constantly being, re being reborn into bodies in order to keep them trapped in this world. And they embraced a form of asceticism and celibacy in order to perfect their souls and have it escape this world and be right reunited with the good God because it's currently imprisoned in this world uh, subject to an evil God. So that was a kind of doctrine of reincarnation that was circulating around the same time that Kabbalists are developing their notions of reincarnation. But is this an adaptation of that? We can't really say. Similarly, of course, the place where we find the oldest and most developed notions of reincarnation um, is in India, especially in some of the Brahmanic Hindu texts. So is this an, uh, the result of exposure of Jews to uh, South Asian culture in the Middle Ages, which they were exposed to. There were Jews living in, uh, the South, in South Asia. There were Jews who um, were doing trade across the Silk Route and other possible avenues for communication. Um, I I think not only can we not really answer that question, but that the issue of religious borrowing is really too simplistic. Um, rarely do I think religions just borrow one idea and adopt it uh, into another context. What we do see though, is that certain ideas are endorsed or embraced as being acceptable and useful and reasonable and desirable in particular times and places. And so the question I wanna think about today is why reincarnation was embraced by those who embraced it. Um, what kinds of pressing social issues did reincarnation help Jews to answer and to address? Um, so the first place where we see discussion of uh, reincarnation is in one of the very earliest Kabbalistic texts, a very mysterious text um, that started in the very early 13th century, Southern France, Northern Spain, the Sefer HaBahir, and that book discusses reincarnation as though it's already a well-established Jewish doctrine. The Sefer Habahir has complex roots. It's hard to say exactly where it comes from, um, that it could be a composite text that draws from various forms of late Midrash in other places. There's a whole body of scholarship about the Sefer Habahir. But what is interesting is that it seems to embrace reincarnation in an unproblematic way. Um, the, where we really see reincarnation get a boost is by the famous Kabbalist and rabbi and leader of the Spanish Jewish community of the mid 13th century, Rabbi Moses ben Nachman or Nachmanides. He treats the doctrine of reincarnation, though he doesn't use the term Gilgul in the way that some of the later authorities do. He relates it to the secret of impregnation or Ibur, um, or also the secret of the intercalation of Hebrew months. He describes it as a very secret doctrine and his references to it are extremely cryptic. But over the course of the second half of the 13th century and especially into the early 14th century, Kabbalists start talking about reincarnation very, very openly. And they do this in the context of interpretation of, my, of Nachmanides comments on the secret of leveret marriage or yibum. Um, and that is the, the the law in the Bible that says that if a man dies uh, childless, his wife is to marry that man's brother in order to have a child with the man, with, with his brother, the brother of the deceased man, with, uh, that, that his, his wife should have a child with his brother and that that child would then be counted as part of that man's line in the lineage. And so some Kabbalists say that this is a subtle allusion in the, in the Bible to the notion that um, it's possible for one's soul to be recreated, as though this the deceased man's soul is being recreated through this union of his brother and his widow. Um, the other places where 
there's discussion of recreation of reincarnation in Nachmanides um, is in the interpretation of the book of Job where there it brings up the question of theodicy or why bad things happen to good people and is seen as part of the inter the, the way to understand the Talmudic um, conundrum that's described as uh, tzaddik veralo, tzaddik vetovlo, tzaddik veralo, rasha vetovlo, rasha veralo, which means there are good people, righteous people who have good lives, righteous people who have bad lives, evil people who have good lives, evil people who have bad lives. They take it as a given that it would clearly seem to be the case that there is no simple correlation between being a righteous person and having good fortune. Misfortune definitely befalls people who would appear to be very, very righteous. Um, and Job was obviously was known as someone who was very, very righteous, but God in his wager with Satan um, afflicted him in order to see what would happen. And so in Nachmanides' interpretation of the book of Job, he alludes to um, how this relates to this doctrine of reincarnation in some fashion. And the um, students and the students of the students of Nachmanides do a lot of interpretation of Nachmanides' interpretation and regard reincarnation as part of how one accounts for misfortunes befalling righteous individuals. And they then expand that to say, this is part of how one accounts for misfortune befalling the Jewish people more broadly. And that this is in a reckoning with transgressions of one's past life. So in the case of Job, they would argue that it's not that Job was not righteous, he was very righteous. But the reason why he was suffering was because of transgressions that he had committed in past lives. So even though in this life he was perfectly righteous, he was undergoing necessary suffering in order to continue to perfect his soul. So this idea continues to be discussed, not in the main body of the Zohar, the main portion of the Zohar actually is not that interested in the topic of Gilgul or reincarnation, but in the latter strata of the Zohar, for those of you who are fans of that text, it's in the, the, the Raya Mehemna, um, the, the Tikkunei Zohar, as well as in the section called the Saba de Mishpatim. So these are some of the parts of the Zohar that talk about reincarnation. Um, and by the early 14th century, therefore, the, the Tikkunei Zohar, early 14th century, um, and the students of uh, Nachmanides, really at that point, the cat is out of the bag. Reincarnation is um, suddenly very much a public uh, form of conversation among Kabbalists. And despite the tremendous diversity of opinion about the nature of reincarnation and how it works, um, there was a lot of interest in this subject and it was discussed in tremendous detail. So, okay, bringing together a lot of different voices on reincarnation, here are some of the basics about how this doctrine works. Um, who is reincarnated? So some argue, some Kabbalists argue that only very sinful people are reincarnated and it's a punishment. In fact, it's seen as in some cases a terrible punishment. Others, however, argue, and this becomes the more dominant view, that all people are reincarnated and it's necessary to undergo a succession of lives in order to attain perfection and enter olam haba or the world to come in order to enjoy eternal life and eternal reward. The idea being that each person needs to perfect their soul through the performance of mitzvot, um, the performance of the commandments over the course of multiple lifetimes in order to reach the sort of perfected state necessary in order to, for their soul to go back and rejoin God. The Kabbalists regarded the soul as actually um, emanated down through the 10 divine luminous emanations or the 10 spherot and is in fact part of God. It's an emanation of God's own self into the body, the human body. So the human soul is actually part of God. But in order for the soul to return, it needs to go through a process of purification um, and that this process of purification happens over multiple lifetimes because no one can get everything perfect on the first try. Um, which then begs another question. Why the need for reincarnation at all? What, what is wrong with the world that reincarnation is necessary? Um, and most Kabbalists connect this to the notion of the sin of Adam and Eve. This is actually a Jewish version of um, original sin. And this is sort of one of those interesting questions people ask, do Jews believe in reincarnation? Well, it depends who you ask. Kabbalists certainly do, um, even though others don't. 
And do Jews believe in original sin? And, you know, often we'll say, well, no, Jews don't believe in original sin. But in fact, there are some hints at ideas about original sin in the Talmud. There are some, there are arguments, some scholars argue that there is a doctrine very similar to that. Um, and Kabbalists definitely seem to embrace something like this. So the, the notion of original sin, which became an important doctrine in Christianity, is that all humans are tainted because of the sin in the Garden of, the, uh, in, in the Garden of Eden by Adam and Eve. And that all sins of humans are therefore more sinful. And in Christianity, there's only one solution to this, which is um, to be redeemed through the grace of uh, the death of Christ. Um, for Jews, the idea is that all humans are indeed through their souls and their bodies um, implicated in sin. And the world is, has, was categorically changed. Um, in fact, the very nature of the universe and the cosmos was changed because of the sin of Adam and Eve. But that the solution to this, according to medieval Jewish Kabbalists, is through the performance of Jewish law and the perfection of the soul. And then as more and more Jews perfect their souls and are reunited with God, they will bring about eventually the reconstitution of the world as it was intended to be at the moment of creation before the sin of Adam and Eve. So it's a, an attempt to return to the pre-lapsarian state, as it's called, the state before the sin in the Garden of Eden. Um, and Kabbalists regard Gilgul, or reincarnation, as a very, very important aspect of how um, Jews bring this about, that their soul is reincarnated over successive lifetimes, and as they perfect their performance of commandments, the performance of mitzvot, um, they're able to uh, then bring about this perfection, not only of themselves, but actually of the Jewish collective and of the entire world. Um, and in fact, they would argue that it's not possible to understand the Torah or the nature of the commandments without understanding the secret of reincarnation. So to take an example of one Kabbalist who was writing, he was expelled from uh, Spain as a, in 1492 when he was 13 years old and he moved to the Ottoman Empire and wrote a very, very famous Kabbalistic book um, called, the, called Avodat HaKodesh, or Divine Worship, um, and his name was Meir Ibn Gabai. And he says the following about reincarnation. He says, from the Kabbalah on this matter regarding reincarnation, we comprehend how important it is for one to avoid transgression and the forbidden things mentioned in the Torah, to protect one's soul from them and to be saved from them, lest one comes to be subject to the phenomenon of reincarnation. This is the advantage of one who knows this principle over one who does not know it. Therefore, all who are called by the name of Israel are obligated to seek out wisdom and to search after it, to serve its masters and to draw from it at all times. For by means of it, you will perceive enlightenment and it will guide you towards perfected worship and the performance of the commandments for their own sake. This matter makes known to you the severity of the transgressions and you will distance yourself from them and you will comprehend the extent, comprehend the extent of their evil and their impurity. Without this, it is impossible to understand perfection at all. This matter is profitably, prof, properly understood by the masters of the true wisdom, i.e. Kabbalah. This is all that I wish to speak regarding the subject of transmigration of the souls or Gilgul. So this is Mayor Ibn Gabbai describing in, in no uncertain terms that Gilgul is necessary in order to understand um, the process of enlightenment and perfection of the soul and the nature of the Torah and the commandments. So he makes us a very, very central doctrine which Kabbalists are never shy about taking ideas that were sort of unheard of in the Talmud and declaring them to be the center, central secret inner core of the Judaism since the Bible. Um, and this is certainly one of those doctrines that they go to great pains to give a sort of prime place in the Jewish canon. Um, another question about reincarnation is how many reincarnations does one undergo? Um, again, there are different differences of opinion about this. The Sefer Habahir seems to say a thousand or up to a thousand. Some passages in the later parts of the Zohar, um, as well as some Kabbalists, describe uh, three as the normal number of, of reincarnations and that if you don't get it right by three, then your soul is cut off. Um, but others say it takes as many as it takes. 
Um, so the soul is reincarnated however many times is necessary in order for that individual to perfect their performance of Jewish law and to purify their soul. Um, one very interesting question is, are humans always reincarnated as humans? Are Jews always reincarnated as Jews? Men as men, women as women. And interestingly, starting in the 14th century, we find that there were some prominent Kabbalist, Kabbalistic thinkers who maintained that people can indeed be reincarnated as animals. Jews can be reincarnated as non-Jews, men as women, women as men. Um, people can even, they argue, be reincarnated as plants and other non-human things. There was one important Kabbalist from the early 14th century, Joseph Ben Shalom Ashkenazi, who had a notion that there's a kind of cycling of matter and of spirit and that everything is connected to everything else. And so bodies transform into other bodies. Um, we find physical matter um, being sort of moved from one person to another person, from a person to a plant, from a plant uh, to uh, inanimate, uh, to dirt or, or rocks or minerals. So um, there was this notion of this sort of cycling of matter, that everything was, it was a sort of tremendously ecological way of thinking about it, that everything is interconnected with everything else and that there is a constant flow of spirit and form from one thing to another thing. And that um, any individual life that a person is living is just a moment, a snapshot in this constant flow of matter and of spirit. Um, but different, incarnations represent different kinds of punishment or a tikkun or rectification um, that is part of this rectification of both the self, the individual soul of the one who is being reincarnated, and the tikkun of the world in order to bring about a redemption of the world. Um, so one example that Kabbalists talk about is infant death. Now, unfortunately, this was a fairly common phenomenon in the pre-modern world. Um, and Kabbalists, Jews, they had to make sense of this question. Why do infants die? It, it, does, it doesn't seem just. Um, clearly, it can't be because of any fault of their own. Similarly, for um, they asked the question uh, about miscarriage. Well, there's no transgression here that could account for why this happens. And so what they argue is that um, infant death is actually the soul of that infant undergoing a form of mild punishment in order to achieve its final perfection. Um, so they argue that a righteous person with very little left for themselves to correct actually is able to provide that correction to their soul, that tikkun, by being um, reincarnated as an infant that then dies in infancy. And that this is the sort of final step in the progression towards uh, perfection, which has a certain comforting ring to it in the sense that a, an infant that dies is actually just the soul of a righteous person um, achieving perfection. Um, but they also argue for things like birth defects. How do you account for people who are born with their birth defects? And uh, Kabbalists would say, well, this is actually the result of transgressions in previous lives. Um, but so it's still clearly a very, um, it's a, there's, there's a, a sharp edge to the way that Kabbalists think about and imagine um, reincarnation. It is indeed a punishment and they regard life as itself a kind of punishment. And in fact, they regard the entire universe as we know it since the transgression of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden as a kind of upside down world. Um, a world in which nothing is as it should be. In fact, the intention, they argue in the early stages of creation, God wanted to create a universe made entirely out of spiritual light emanated from his own self, from his own infinity, the Ein Sof. Um, but that because of the transgressions of Adam and Eve, the world experienced this sort of trans transformation and became physical and material. And the soul is now trapped in this cycle of materiality and the cycle of birth and death. And the goal is to escape that cycle and that the process of escaping the cycle involves a purification of the soul through the sufferings of this world. Um, one of the ways though that the um, soul is elevated uh, after more serious transgressions is by being reincarnated as an animal. And there are different types of animal reincarnations 
depending on the type of transgression and depending on uh, the severity. To be reincarnated as a pure animal, meaning an animal that can be offered for sacrifice or can be um, subjected to kosher slaughter, was seen as being on a somewhat higher level, um, that the, the souls in that case are elevated when they are sacrificed in the temple, or since then, by being slaughtered in a kosher manner and eaten by a righteous person, that provides a sort of incorporation of the matter of that animal's body into the righteous person's body, and then an elevation of the soul that was trapped in that animal if for future successive, hopefully better reincarnations. If a person commits a lot of transgressions, they push that process backwards and need more lives in order to move forward. So the argument is, you know, you don't know what you've done in your past lives. You might be really close to having perfected your soul. Don't push the wheel backwards by committing transgressions. Um, the people who've been reincarnated into animals, they're elevated, as I mentioned, through eating, which leads some Kabbalists. Joseph of Hamadan was an important late 13th century Kabbalist who talked a lot about reincarnation. And he argued that only righteous individuals should eat meat and that um, non-righteous people whoever those are, should not eat meat because then they're not helping the soul of the person trapped in that animal. Um, they also argue that you should never eat a non-kosher animal because it could be your friend, your brother, that is trapped in that animal. And they argue that eating non-kosher meat is similar to cannibalism because of the souls of the people who are in those bodies. They also would argue that, non -Jew that Jews are reincarnated as non-Jews, which provides a, a very fascinating and interesting question and window into how Kabbalists understood, what is the nature of their anthropology? How do they understand human selfhood? Um, clearly, you can have a Jewish soul in a non-Jewish body, meaning that you, you can have this idea of the body of that person is non-Jewish, is Gentile, the soul is Jewish, and those are somehow brought together. Um, and then they argue that the only way for that person's soul to be redeemed is for that non-Jew to convert to Judaism. And they use this as an sort of explanation for how conversion works. And that is, is in fact a return of these lost souls of Israel to return to the people of Israel and then continue their progression um, in the process of Gilgul or reincarnation. Um, there's also a notion of measure for measure punishment, meaning that the punishment always fits the crime. And the, the very same Joseph of Hamadan, uh, who I mentioned, he has many different transgressions that he describes and he specifies what the reincarnation is for that transgression. So a few of them that he describes are that for the transgression of adul adultery, one is reborn as a donkey because donkeys commit lots of, um, of, of uh, adultery, apparently. Um, eating bread on Passover, one is born, reborn as a Gentile who is not prohibited for eating bread, from eating bread on Passover, Passover. So actions in one life that are similar to that of a donkey, one is reborn as a donkey. Actions in uh, one's life that are similar to the actions of a Gentile, one is reborn as a Gentile. A high priest who marries a wi widow is then reborn as an Israelite or as a woman because an Israelite, right, if we think of Kohen, Levi, Israel, a Kohen, especially the high priest, is not allowed to marry a widow. Um, an Israelite is also allowed to marry a widow. So the punishment for that high priest is that they're born as an Israelite or as a woman. An Israel, a, a Jewish woman is also allowed to marry a, a widow. And one that I don't understand at all, but maybe one of you can explain it to me, for committing, adulter committing idolatry, for the worship of idols, one is reincarnated as a rabbit. I'm not sure why. It's possible that rabbits commit a lot of idolatry. I don't know. Um, uh, it's, it, I, I did wonder if it's because of the, the, the posture of rabbits that they look like they're kneeling down and bowing, but I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, over the course of the Middle Ages, this doctrine gained tremendous popularity and it gained more and more acceptance. And my question is, why would this be? How do we understand this and make sense of it? And Perhaps I would suggest reincarnation provides a different way for Jews to think about their history, both personally and collectively. This is a way to imagine that one's soul is on an epic journey, that what happens in one's individual life is only a portion 
the portion that we can see of a much longer journey of the soul that we are all responsible for. And the objective is to play a role in a much longer narrative of perfecting the world, a much longer narrative of tikkun. The timeline, in a sense, in which any Jewish person imagines themselves to occupy, uh, the place in which they occupy on that timeline is now elongated. It's part of a connective, successive series of lives and experiences that are part of a much sort of grander narrative of exile and redemption, of fall and resolution, of purification and of adorning and correcting the world of tikkun, of correcting that which has been um, in a fallen state since the, the transgression of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. Um, in a moment in which a, any Jewish person finds themselves to sort of contemplate that they're in a period of historical decline or collective Jewish suffering, Gilgul does help to address that question in the sense that the sufferings that people experience in their individual lives or in the Jewish collective experience is not actually a sense of setback. It's not a, um, it's not a sign of divine abandonment. It is in fact the opposite of how it appears. It's progress on the road to redemption rather than a regression away from it sufferings that people experience in the world are part of the process of the refinement of souls. It's part of the process of the attainment of redemption and of reconstituting the world as it was intended um, at the moment of the, the, the creation of the garden, uh, uh, in the garden of, in, in the moment of creation just before the transgression in the garden of Eden. Um, Mayor Ibn Gabai, who I mentioned before, he argues that really this is the purpose of Judaism more broadly, and certainly the purpose of reincarnation, is to reconstitute the world as God had intended it. And he's very sort of unapologetic in describing it that way. Um, the, the, the manner in which God intended the world to be um, has suffered a setback, and everything that happens in this world through the process of Jewish observance of the commandments and their reincarnation over the course of many lives in order to achieve perfection um, is a, an attempt to put back together that which was broken at the moment of the transgression of Adam and Eve and to bring about as partners with God, creation as God had originally intended it. This progress towards redemption is understood by Kabbalists in their interpretation of a sort of famous and very cryptic passage in the Talmud, in Tractate Yevamot 63b, where it says that the son of David, or the Messiah, will not arrive until all the souls of the goof have been consumed. This is a very strange comment. What is the goof? So goof means body. So what does this mean that there is a storehouse of souls that have to be born into the world before the Messiah comes? Some people understand it that way. But many Kabbalists understand this to mean that they're, all of the souls that are currently embodied are, in a sense, old souls, and that they have to be perfected and reassimilated into God before new souls can come into the world, and that the Messiah will be the last of these new souls to be born into the world and to bring about the days of the Messiah and then usher in full redemption and the world to come. And so this, some souls, of course, are older than others, but bringing about the sort of the new souls uh, in the messianic age, it's necessary for the existing souls to observe the Torah properly and to complete their series of Gilgulim or of reincarnations. And Jews, in a sense, are therefore in the driver's seat of determining how long that is going to take and how long um, until the, the process of collective refinement has been completed. Um, in the early modern period, it is perhaps for this reason that Kabbalah, even when it underwent a major reformulation um, by the Kabbalists in Sfat, uh, under the sort of the, in the school of Isaac Luria, um, Gilgul 
was enthusiastically embraced in this context. They were very interested in reincarnation. Um, and in fact, this was when they, they de developed a much more complex notion that souls have particular roots within the realm of the Spirod, and they had a very complicated idea of like 240 different aspects of God within these different realms of the Spirod, and that one could have a, a, a root of their soul from one of the Spirod in one of the supernal worlds, and there were five worlds. We don't need to get into the details of that, but it was very, very complicated. And Isaac Luria and his disciples were understood as Kabbalistic masters who could tell someone what their soul root was. And they could tell them what their past lives were and therefore what they need to do in this world in order to complete their tikkun of themselves in order to elevate their soul to reconstitute the divine in its sort of intended state in the early stages of creation. So this idea is embraced, but it's elaborated upon. Hasidic masters also embrace the notion of, tika, of, of Gilgul and talk about different historical people in the, the sages from the Talmud and rabbinic uh, biblical characters who are being, who are reborn as certain individuals. And of course the Hasidic or Kabbalistic master is the one who can perceive this and knows which people are from which souls. One interesting question therefore is why contemporary Jews are not as interested in the doctrine um, of reincarnation. Is it because Jews are more rational? Um, is it because our sense of time is different? Um, now again, I'm interested in this from a much more uh, academic perspective in terms of how it helps us understand Jewish perceptions of time, history, and selfhood. I, I don't know if you ask me, you know, is there such a thing as reincarnation? I'll say, I don't really know, but I found a great manuscript about it in uh, the library you see behind me is the Oxford Bodleian Library. And there's one manuscript called Inyan HaGilgul, or on the subject of Gilgul, that talks about many of these matters we just described. It was um, copied by a scribe in the city of Syracuse, um, in uh, Sicily in the, just before the, at some point before the expulsion of Jews from Sicily, so before 1494. And he describes it as, be sure I have his exact language here, I transcribed the text. Um, he says, it is well known that the matter of Gilgul is a secret from the secrets of our sacred Torah, and it is a, 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 an awesome matter with tremendous benefit for the body and the soul. Um, that's in Oxford, Bodley, and Huntington 352. Uh, but it's, this is a really interesting manuscript, and we find many texts like this. Um, they regarded this as a really key idea in terms of how to understand the body and the soul, how to understand Judaism and the Torah. So is it just that our sense of reality is different? Is it that our sense of time is different, that we're used to thinking about the time that a person occupies as the duration of their life? Maybe there's an afterlife, as Rabbi Spitz can describe, right? That we're used to thinking forward. We don't always think backwards in the same way. We think of the people in the past as being different from ourselves. Medieval Jews thought of the people of the past as being the same as themselves, which means that when they talk about biblical history, they're talking about their own historical moment. And so when we often say, wow, medieval Jews didn't write a lot of history about their own historical moment, and it's true, they wrote chronicles sometimes, but not that often. I would say this is correct, but that doesn't mean that they didn't think about history and they didn't think about the place of Jews within the historical process. It's that the way they talked about it, their discursive approach to it was to talk about things like reincarnation because they didn't separate between their own experiences and the experiences of Jews be who came before them or the Jews who will come after them because those are themselves too. It's this like, much more sort of temporally expanded sense of the self. But I also wonder, is it perhaps the case that it's harder to, accommodate, to account for the tragedies of the 20th century that Jews experienced through the notion of rectification of past transgressions or purification of the soul, because our, our tragedies are too great to understand in that way. Does the Holocaust interrupt the possibility of thinking about Gilgul in this way, thinking about reincarnation in this fashion? I don't know. Um, I'm not really sure that we can answer that question, but I think we can see that the idea of Gilgul has left a significant mark on Jewish thought, and it represents a very interesting chapter in how Jews imagine themselves, how they've represented themselves within their own past 
their own present and what they perceive to be their own future. So I'm happy to take any questions that you have. You can put questions in the chat. I don't know that I can um, keep up with all of the questions here, but I'll try to um, take well, a look yeah, and I'll let me, open this to Ari as well. Yeah, uh, I'll, let me try to facilitate. So sure. first I will say when I go out into my cul-de-sac, I'll be very nice to landscaping now, given that <laughs> maybe, and then we have lots of rabbits as uh, Harris and Jan. So I don't know what that says about our neighborhood, but um, that's number one. Number two, I, I had a poll I wanted to put up. I'm gonna put this poll up now. We like to participate. So I'm gonna launch a poll. Um, so please, um, as you're sitting there, answer the poll. So we'll see um, how many people actually know who you are from before and how many people believe in reincarnation. Because um, I think that there are a lot more than you think. So here's my question. I think we, modern Jews, encounter reincarnation either out there in the general world. It, it, it comes up particularly um, in mystical traditions, but in our own tradition, through, through our interactions with groups of Hasidim, particularly Chabad, which is the only group that interacts with us. And I know that when bad things happen, people have told me, and I've actually heard it myself, where Chabad people will show up at the house and they will say exactly what you said. So they're getting it. And I know Chabad is very influenced by the Zohar and Kabbalistic texts. So is that from your perspective where we are getting this um, particular um, reincarnation back in our contemporary Judaism? Is that the kind of the, 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 the avenue where most of us are, are, are seeing it these days? That's going to be my guess. Um, although renewal, Jewish renewal, I forgot to mention, it's not just the Hasidic movement, but also the renewal movement. Um, because Hasidism and renewal both embrace uh, Kabbalah, more than we find in the sort of traditional rabbinic Ashkenazi culture. So uh, as I've, I've mentioned, some of you remember this from, if you recall when I was out um, five years ago, I'm sure you remember exactly everything I said about the history of Kabbalah, um, but that we live in a sort of bizarre blip historically over the past 800 years, Kabbalah has been so important. And um, it's only really since the enlightenment in primarily Ashkenazi circles that there's been this sort of decabalization of Judaism. Um, and it's been reintroduced and re-embraced in the 20th century in some really interesting ways. Um, it's still not a sort of typical part of rabbinic training in most Ashkenazi forms of uh, reform, conservative and orthodox rabbinic training. Um, but that is a post-enlightenment, Ashkenazi, generally Western European phenomenon. Hasidic Jews uh, still thought about Kabbalah and therefore reincarnation quite a bit. Um, and uh, many forms of Sephardic Judaism um, are much more comfortable with these ideas. So they, they did not have that kind of break with the Kabbalist tradition like we did see in some forms of Ashkenazi Judaism. Well, in our poll right now, most people have no idea who you were. So that's good to know. You're new, look, 75% of the, 78% of the audience weren't, didn't oh, participate yeah. in our one month count. And I would say 40%, 40 a little more than 40% do believe in reincarnation in this group. And this is a highly educated, select CSP group, just so you know. Um, so if Rabbi Spitz, if you're there, I wanted to get your perspective on reincarnation in, in kind of in the contemporary world. Then I have some, we have some more questions for um, Hartley. Rabbi Spitz, are you there? Mm -hmm. Yes. So where, where does reincarnation fall? You're a conservative rabbi. You're a, you know, a member of the highest echelon of conservative Judaism in America, modern Judaism. Where do you fall within this context of reincarnation briefly? Uh, and have you had any, any experience? I know you, for people who haven't read your book, you talk about some things that you've personally experienced. So two thoughts. One, in the past, uh, I want to answer your question, but I also want to continue with your comments, Hartley, a moment ago about the difference between our lives and lives of people in an earlier time. The lives we live aren't so hard that we're longing for the world to come. We more or less live fairly comfortable lives of opportunity. And in that sense, I'm not sure how much the lack of focus for some on, the, on reincarnation is no different for many people who don't think about the afterlife at all. So many Jews, when asked about the afterlife, would say they really haven't given it much thought. We are much more this worldly focused because we're not suffering and longing for what yet might be. Now, in regard to reincarnation, another piece which I mentioned in my short comments was this popularity of past life regression, 
marked by Brian Weiss's book, which sold over, I think, 30 million, translated into over 30 languages, including Hebrew. And the idea of past life regression was that just like a person can be hypnotized to recall a trauma at an early age that's often a source of neurosis or anxiety that's not readily remembered, so likewise a person can be brought back into an awareness of what they would not normally focus on, memories from before they were born, from a previous life. So that, that dimension that I've been surprised by in terms of its presence in modern therapy contexts. I wouldn't dismiss that. Last comment in terms of this, what I find of all the topics that relate to the afterlife that my book touches on with my seeking to answer the question as a juror weighing the evidence, do I believe it's true? Regarding reincarnation, I have seen many people uh, and I have learned how to do the hypnosis recall previous lives. I don't have enough data. I haven't done enough or seen enough to be able to know beyond a reasonable doubt if it's in fact wishful thinking, archetypes, or in fact a memory of the past pointing to reincarnation. But I do know that there is a great more mystery in and around death. And what happens is people move toward death then is part of my rational world. Thank so you. those are really helpful and interesting thoughts, Rabbi. I appreciate that. And, and when you say we live comfortable lives, this is true. Um, and medieval people, medieval Jews, could not stop thinking about the question of collective and individual misfortune, even when they lived in contexts and circumstances that were, in their own immediate sense, um, somewhat comfortable. So um, Salo Baron was a historian of medieval Judaism who argued um, persuasively that we have to be beware of the lachrymose approach to Jewish history, thinking that it's sort of, you know, they killed us over here and then they killed us over there, that it's nothing but a, a series of misfortunes. And he's right about that. There certainly, it was an enormous production of Jewish religion and literature and culture um, from the Middle Ages. It wasn't all bad all the time. But on the other hand, we can go too far with that. Jews in the Middle Ages had to think about the fact that their lives were contingent on whoever was the most recent king, um, whoever was the most recent sovereign they were able to make a deal with. And that could all change if that king is overthrown, if there's a war, if that king dies and their, their, their son doesn't um, embrace the same policies towards them. There, there was this tremendous sense of a, the sword of Democles hanging over their heads. And so it was necessary to account for that. And Jewish thinkers had to make sense of misfortune at both the individual and the collective level. And Gilgul was a, a useful mechanism for that, at least for some. So let me ask a question because I, I, I think I know uh, and Rabbi's trying to talk. You have to unmute yourself. So I'll just add one more thing. And now I'm coming and after in a moment, get my court to plug in my computer. But I'll add one more thing, Hartley, is having been a presenter on this topic of reincarnation for a while and the topic of the afterlife. And I come to it as a pulpit rabbi who officiates at funerals, which is different than an academic perspective. But the piece I've also learned, because I know from watching the chat, people are asking you, Hartley, whether it's true or not. And I just wanted to share that what I learned is different historical times bring to the foreground different needs. And so clearly there's a context for reincarnation and even the afterlife being more of a focus. But what I've also learned is that if you want something to be true, it doesn't mean it's false. So the fact that you want to be loved and lovable doesn't mean you're not. It just means you have to have your eyes wide open in determining what, how the bias affects your conclusion, which is only to say, like many of the things that mysticism deals with, a separate question of how history influences its presence is whether it's real or not. 
Thank you. Um, so going back to what you were talking about, Hartley, in, in our Kabbalistic tradition of Gilgul reincarnation, do non-Jews go through this or is this only Jews? I know you said Jews can be re reincarnated in a non-Jewish person's body, but does, does the tradition talk about non-Jewish people going through this or is this only for Jews? Um, so that's a good question. The, the medieval Kabbalah, like medieval life, it was very ethnocentric. They were unapologetic that like only Jews and Jewish souls were the things that were really divine. Um, so they don't think that non-Jews undergo reincarnation. But someone like Mayor Ibn Gabai had mentioned, um, he does think that as long as non-Jews observe the seven laws of Noah, the sort of, their sort of seven basic um, commandments that are seen as pertaining to non-Jews, um, that they are able to be rewarded in the world to come. And they, he had sort of a notion that actually it's a little evocative of uh, um, the, the Calabrian abbot Joachim of Fiore in the 11th century, that at the time of the sort of final redemption, um, there will be this gathering of all peoples together and non-Jews won't convert to Judaism. They'll remain non-Jews, but they'll be rewarded in the world to come for having observed the laws that pertain to them, even though there weren't that many. And that Jews, they just had a lot more. They had 613 commandments instead of only seven. Um, but that, no, the, the, the process of reincarnation, at least as it was of interest to medieval Kabbalah or to medieval Kabbalists only pertains to Jewish souls. Mike Rubin has a question. You may remember Mike because he came to probably all of your programs. Didn't he meet? Didn't he meet uh, at your program? Didn't he meet Alita? Was that the connection? Is that Mike? And you? Uh, well, whatever. Uh, Mike has a question. How do you connect uh, resurrection, uh, our, our tradition of resurrection of the dead, with reincarnation? Did that come up in your research? Yes. So I saw that question just now, and that's a great question because, of course, it's a problem, right? If you have a whole bunch of different lives with different bodies. And you also have a do doctrine that, uh, you know, since the days of the, of the Pharisees, that the, there is a resurrection of the body. Well, then which body gets resurrected, right? Or does the soul go and be in a whole bunch of different bodies? So this, this was a problem. So some people said the last body gets resurrected too bad for all those other people. They said, yeah, but that body had had a life it had children it had a family. Like, how do they have this big reunion in the world to come if they don't get resurrected? So then other people said that there's this sort of splitting of the soul. The soul can divide into sparks and that each body and each self is resurrected and given its, its reward. Um, in, you know, because even the ones that committed transgressions were sort of purified of that through the experiences of the sufferings of this world. Um, Yosef of Hamadan actually thinks that the nature of Gehenna or the sort of the hell of the afterlife, which is temporary, Judaism doesn't have a permanent hell of afterlife, uh, that that's actually what happens when you're reincarnated as an animal, that that's a very difficult reincarnation. Um, but that they, they, did, they did debate this because they had to find a way to reconcile this with a question that obviously in the Talmud, where they talk about resurrection of the body, they didn't have to think about multiple lives and um, the, the same soul having many bodies in many lifetimes. They didn't think about that. But I, I think the one that became most common, at least in Kabbalistic circles, was the idea that there's this sort of splitting of the soul. You know, I was in India in 1997, driving up to Dharamsala and had this crazy driver. And he just driving like we could have flown off the side of the cliff. And he told me, it doesn't matter. We're coming back. It doesn't matter. Said, it matters to me. <laughs> <laughs> Not right now. Yeah. Um, would you mind, people have asked, would you mind sharing the list? You, you threw out so many names um, in your research. Can you share a little syllabus so that people who want to do more research into this can look at it themselves? And I assume, are some of these things online so they can find the resources? I don't know if they're in English, but I don't yeah, know about your research. A lot of the primary it? texts are not um, in, are not in, available in English, but there are lots of things about scholarship about reincarnation, and I would be happy to uh, provide a list for everyone. And so are you, your work you're doing right now, are you writing a new book on this? Is that where it's we're an, heading? It's a chapter of the book, Lives and Afterlives, um, Reincarnation and the Medieval Jewish Present. So it's just how, how this was part of um, the way that medieval Jews, at least Kabbalistic medieval Jews, uh, medieval Kabbalists who were writing and, and really interested in this question, it was then part of, um, you know, how they understood time, how they understood their, their place in time. And I, I actually, I, I sort of debate, what is the bigger difference between 
um, sort of the worldviews today and worldviews of medieval Kabbalists? Is it around reincarnation or is it around just the way in which we think of ourselves as connected to the past and future, being identified with it in, in very real ways? I think that, you know, if we look at the poll here and 40% of the people on this, there's 140 of us on the call right now, 40% um, of the people actually personally believe in reincarnation, maybe that's less of a, a rupture with the thinking of medieval Kabbalists on this question that I would have thought. Um, but that, that sense of being very connected um, to a much broader time frame, and that being really important to how they think of themselves as Jewish people experiencing Jewish history. Um, that I, I suspect is a, is a bigger difference. We're used to thinking about history as like a chronicle of like, well, in 1948, the state of Israel was established, like events, dates, wars, um, governments, things like that. Um, and that was just much less common for how medieval Jews thought about history. They thought about it in a different way. When we, I still think for most of us, when we close our eyes and situate ourselves in history, we're sort of transported back to history class or to things that sound like what's in history books. That's the more common historical discourse that we engage with. If you're in the Middle Ages and you think about your place in history, you might think about reincarnation instead. Last question. So if you go through all these reincarnations, and you never, can you never get it right? And if you never get it right, what happens to your soul, to the soul? So, well, some, like some parts of the Zohar seem to say you only get three chances and then your soul suffers the rabbinic punishment of kari, or one soul being cut off from the Jewish collective. So there are some who suggest that. There are others who suggest that, no, you keep coming back until you get it right. And that it's, it's really not a choice, that the world will continue. Be, and, you know, history comes to an end through the final culmination in messianic redemption and the reconstitution of the world in its Edenic state, right after creation, but before the transgression of Adam and Eve. That's where sort of the sort of material world as we know it ceases to exist. The world is sort of this perfect realm of divine light. History comes to an end at that point, but it will persist until Jews find a way um, to perfect each of their souls that are out there reincarnating. Right? Um, so the idea is to shorten the timeline of history, but it can't be escaped. Right. It's definitely a good way to, to get people to keep kosher and <laughs> the things. So I think Rabbi Spitz probably should reinvest re in, in this concept in the conservative movement and speak about it much more from the Bema every Friday night. Like what's going to happen to you if you do not keep kosher this week, you may end up as the, as the you know, pet cat of someone else. <laughs> um, I haven't been able to, uh, yeah, it's Groundhog Day. We'll, we'll finish up with one question that I, 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 I'm trying to do the math in my head because you have souls coming back, but don't, don't you have new souls? And how does all the mathematics work here? I'm very confused. Is that dealt with in the Kabbalah? Kabbalah? Uh, they are interested in this question. And so um, there is the idea that the, the, so one idea is that the new souls, the, the final new soul would be the Messiah's soul. Others say that the Messiah is actually going to be a reincarnation of Moses. And that Adam, the soul of Adam was the first incarnation of that soul. The soul of Moses was the, um, the second um, uh, incarnation of that soul, and then it will be the Messiah that will be the last incarnation of that soul. Um, but the, this question of new souls versus old souls, the, the more common version is that all the souls that, at least all the Jewish souls that were created, exist already. Um, they're part of the 600,000 souls that left Egypt, and that then they've splintered into more, but that they are the ones out there reincarnating and that they need to complete themselves. You end up with fewer and fewer of them as they complete, complete themselves and escape the cycle of birth and death. Um, again, if you're you know, studying Hinduism, it does sound like samsara, right? But in any event, they, those are the ones that have escaped and that once they're all used up, then the Messiah comes and sort of completes everything. Well, given the fact that our Jewish population is diminishing, I guess now you've given a good reason for that right? The number of Jews in the world is going down, which means very close to messianic times, and we must be doing very well. So that, that, we'll, we'll end on that good note. Well, you've re-explained the diminishment of the Jewish people in a very positive cut way. Thank you for helping us and helping us. And people, cat people are very happy with the reincarnation of their pet cats. It's so, 
But my last question is, do people come back? Is it better to be a cat or a dog? Don't know. We'll leave that open. Maybe you can think about that. I'll go with the dog personally, but the cat people will probably go with the cats. I don't know what you are. Are you a dog person or a cat person? You have a dog. Okay. Yeah. We, we, you, you and I know what's better. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, I just want to thank everybody. Thank you thank for telling. Oh, thank you for taking us in the rabbit hole. Literally. <laughs> I'm really going to have a strange perspective on rabbits forever. But thank you for taking us to this world of Kabbalah, not only explaining to us the origin of of our of reincarnation in Jewish tradition, but but the whys of the um, of reincarnation in Jewish tradition. And looking forward to getting your list, your syllabus to share with people. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing when you're freed from jail, everyone. Don't forget, will you show us the picture again where you are? Everyone, you missed it. This is where he really is. He's being held in a basement in, in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, he had, he, he's a very boyish person. I don't think he shaves. So that's why he's, he's very clean. He hasn't grown anything, but his hair is growing. So we need to raise money for CSP so we can free him. So please send money to CSP. This is a good time before the end of the year. I really want to see the sunlight again. He, we got to get him out of the basement. Look how pale he is. Okay, well, hopefully you'll come back and teach us some more. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hartley, it was a pleasure. Thanks, for so. ours, it's nice seeing you. We look forward to celebrating with you in the month of January. Um, new people, Howard Taylor, nice to see you. Natasha, nice to see you. Um, Joanne Hannock, always nice to see you. Louis Sherby, you're a regular. Joel Berman, ah, Rabbi Berman, welcome. Michael Rubin, always nice to have you. Um, and I see Sharon Chase. We honored you, Sharon Chase, recently at a program about artists, just in case, yes. I wanted to make sure you knew that. Elaine Whitkoff, nice to meet you. I got to go do some work. So Hartley, get a haircut. Get, get, get that Floby thing. Do something. <gasps> I um, need it. Trust me. Send us, your, send us the stuff. I'll share it with everybody. Thank you for joining us. Take care, everybody.